you want to press start recording. So you'll just need to transition and then start talking. So, so, you're, so good. you're good to go, yeah. Okay. Hello everyone, um, so thank you for tuning in tonight. So tonight we're going to be looking at how beavers can help uh, the wildlife. Okay, so my name's Alicia and I work uh, for Wildlife Trust Wales on the Welsh Beaver Project. So my name is Alicia and I work for the Welsh Treaty Project with Wildlife Trust Wales. So the Welsh Treaty Project is run by Wildlife Trust Wales on behalf of the five trusts within Wales. And we've been looking at the feasibility of reintroducing um, beavers back into Wales and more recently looking at um, the actual reintroductions itself. But tonight I'll be talking um, sort of about um, the impacts and benefit, um, impact benefits uh, beavers can have on uh, the wildlife. So just as a recap, um, in terms of beaver ecology, um, so first of all, so beavers are rodents, they're the largest rodents we have in the northern hemisphere. Unlike other rodents, they are social and monogamous uh, creatures. They live in um, breeding pairs and form family groups with their young. They have one litter per year, the young is, are known as kits. Um, and they'll form a family group of um, two or three generations of kits. And those kits will stay within the family group until they're two, three years old, and that's when they'll start dispersing off to look for their own, and own mates and forming their own family groups. Beavers are quite long-lived animals. Uh, they have a life expectancy um, about 10 years plus. They are, however, territorial animals um, and don't always tolerate neighbouring beaver families. They are semi-aquatic, um, so famous being, being semi-aquatic, they like to live in or near water, and this is mainly a predator avoidance strategy, um, and they have all their sensory organs, eyes, ears, nose, on top of their head, so when they first emerge in the water, they can have a good um, listen out um, and have um, for any danger that might be out there, and sort of smelling any danger um, that might be out there. So they rarely go more than 20 metres away from the water's edge. They're also herbivores, and so have a wide dietary range, eating soft vegetation in the summer and then in the autumn, winter months, we're switching to a wooded diet. So willow and birch um, forms quite a large part of their diets. They're also crepuscular, which means they're active at dawn and dusk. So beavers are often referred to as a keystone species. Now, keystone species is something that has um, sort of a great uh, disproportional effect. Um, on, um, on its local environment, on the local ecosystem, um, with other, uh, other wildlife. And this is a, an effect that's beneficial for other wildlife in the area. And so, analogy is often drawn with a keystone, uh, with a, an archway, a stone archway, where the keystone is at the top, supporting that archway. But if that keystone was to be removed, then that archway will, will fall down and will collapse. And that's what happens um, in an ecosystem where you lose beavers. Eventually, other species will be lost, and biodiversity is um, far less is, is reduced compared with what it would have been if you had beavers in there helping to maintain that local ecosystem. Here we have a really nice um, drawing that's been that illustrates this really well. This is um, being created by Ark Nature. They're an NGO in the Netherlands, and it just illustrates sort of some of the wildlife that the beavers can benefit um, within, within an ecosystem. So we have aquatic plants um, in, that, uh, in the pool that's been formed by the beaver dam. We have invertebrates, we have amphibians, uh, reptiles such as grass snakes, birds and uh, bats taking advantage of standing deadwood, and then we have razors lower down um, in some of the, the um, some of the grassland meadows being created. And so for the next few slides, we'll just run through some of the species that can benefit within a beaver habitat. 
And so through the beaver activities, um, through coppicing trees, um, so beavers are, are famous for felling trees, but what they really do is coppice. So with the birch and willow trees, um, they'll, they'll fill the tree, the top part of the tree um, um, will, um, will form um, deadwood, will become fallen deadwood. The beavers will be eating the bark from that and they'll use the rest for construction. Um, you can see some of the wood chips around the base of the tree. Eventually, uh, the shoots will then regenerate from that stump, um, and then eventually, once those, um, that vegetation grows up, the bees will, bees will then feed on, on the regrowth. But these, uh, this coppice is great for um, invertebrates and, and small mammals, small birds as well. Beavers will build um, lodges or burrows, and these are purely for living in, resting sites, breeding sites. And beavers will sometimes create uh, dams which will have pools of water forming behind them and they'll create channels in their wetland habitat as well which helps connect up um, their wetland ecosystems. So all these different things can benefit a range of different wildlife. And so this picture was taken um, at an enclosed site in Wales, it's an, a beaver site. Uh, beavers have been here for over seven years now and this is a woodland site, it has a, a large pond in the middle. Um, lots of mature trees on this site and beavers were brought in to help just uh, maintain and restore the habitat. Uh, they found over a number of years the mature trees were just outshading everything else. And so by bringing in beavers have copied away um, a number of the trees and that's opened up the canopy and allowed sunlight to reach the bottom of the the ground, reach the ground, it's allowed new vegetation to come through, lots of floral vegetation come through. As you can still see, there are still trees in the pictures. The beavers haven't taken every single tree out, they've left a lot of mature trees as well. Um, and there's, so you've got an aged structure within that landscape. You've got old, um, mature trees, there's younger trees, uh, there's trees that have recently been felled, um, got new regrowth coming through, and you've got the soft vegetation. So it's a much more diverse habitat. And that's had a great effect on lots of other species. So it's examples of some of the plants that come through in these um, in these habitats. So what the plants do particularly well are where you have beavers, anything from um, marsh marigolds, yellow flag iris, um, ragged robin, uh, water mint as well. This site in, in Wales, water, water mint does really well. Um, it's really abundant on the site and smells wonderful too. Um, invertebrates do particularly well in, in beaver sites, so a number of these photos were taken uh, from the site in Wales. So broad body chaser um, on, on this pond in Wales, beautiful damsel. Um, we have um, zero damselflies as well. Um, and the picture on the bottom left is of an older fly that was actually taken at a beaver site in Bavaria. Older flies um, like to lay their eggs on grasses near um, near water and the larva are aquatic as well so just an example of another species that can benefit um, from a wetland habitat. There's been a number of studies conducted on invertebrates and um, drought flies looked at in particular they do really well in beaver habitats. These are just um, some studies that have been undertaken in Bavaria and Bavaria beavers have been there for a were introduced in the 1960s, so it's a great place to look at um, beavers over a long period of time and the effects they've had on the landscape. So the graph um, on the right, um, this is a site in another in a bee site in northern Franconia in Bavaria, looking at the impacts beavers had from uh, the early 2000s over a number of years and comparing areas where there wasn't much influence of beavers and where there's lots of influence in beavers. And they generally found where you had uh, beavers, there was a lot more invertebrates, a lot more dragonflies. Uh, 13 species of um, dragonfly um, benefited really well in this area from beavers. And they found over the years, um, as beavers moved away, the dragonfly numbers started to decrease as well. And areas where beaver habitats were maintained, um, the dragonfly numbers remained and did very well. But the poster um, is from another study site. This is um, from beaver ponds in the Mount, um, Eiffel mountain range. And this uh, study compared beaver ponds and non-beaver ponds and the number of dragonflies uh, within those ponds. And they found within the ponds, uh, 20, 27 um, species of uh, dragonfly were recorded. In the non-beaver ponds, they only recorded four species of dragonflies. And in ponds that had in beaver influence, but the beavers have moved away, so uh, we're no longer being maintained by beavers, there are seven species of dragonflies being recorded, so it just gives you an idea of um, 
the numbers um, that were there. And with the beaver ponds, it was so you had beaver ponds, so you have still water, shallow water, deep water, and then different flow rates of the water as well. So many different species could take advantage um, of the beaver habitats. And so Mediterranean species were recorded here, um, and other species that uh, like more um, boreal habitats were found in these beaver habitats. So just giving an example of a diverse range of habitats that were available for uh, these dragonflies um, in, the, in these studies. So with the dragonflies and with in, um, increasing invertebrates in general, this can be beneficial for bird life. Um, so all these pictures here were taken from the bee pond um, in Wales um, that I referred to um, earlier. So with, in summer there's an abundance of dragonflies on this pond and here we've got pictures of um, um, Pied wagtail um, walking over the pond and just plucking uh, dragonflies from the air. Pied, uh, um, pied flycatcher and spotted flycatcher have been um, recorded in this site this year, and kingfisher um, have started to return to this site as well over the past few years. And here we have a video of a um, pied wagtail feeding its, its chick with invertebrates. Um, at the pond. And in this pond, just uh, this sort of film, the same pond, but have a close look in the corner, you've got a beaver um, swimming along. You may notice a small bird popping up beside him. So that small bird is a little grieve, and over the, uh, we've noticed over the years that when the beavers emerge, the little grief will merge as well, um, and we find it's often diving very close to the beaver. So it's possible that when the beaver emerges, and it's stirring up the sediment, it's making it easier for the little reefs um, to forage. So for us, it's got this thinking, is this a learned behavior by the little reefs since these, these beavers have been in this pond, or are we witnessing a sort of a, a co-evolution, a relationship here that's um, existed um, in the past, and now we're just witnessing again now the beavers are, are starting to return and we are looking at the reintroduction. So, really interesting to see the behaviour of the little reef. And often, when we're bee watching at this site, the little reef will alert us to the beavers emerging. The beavers themselves are often very silent, and obviously, ducks do very well and really like the beaver pond too. Amphibians are another uh, group that do really well uh, on beaver sites. Just the amount of water um, that's in the area um, is great for the, for the frog spawn, uh, so for the aquatic life stage, and then as they, as they mature into adults, and obviously feeding on the invertebrates that are around as well. And a great example of this is from uh, Devon Wildlife Trust. So Devon Wildlife Trust have had a beaver enclosure since 2011, and where they've been monitoring uh, the effects of beavers on, on the habitat and the hydrology. But over the years, they really noticed um, an increase in frog spawns. So when a beaver pair were first released into the site in 2011, only 10 clumps of frog spawn were, was recorded. Um, and then by uh, 2017, over 600 clumps of frog spawn were recorded. So again, just the abundance of, of water has um, um, attracted the frogs to that site and just taken advantage of all that water. And that's um, really had a beneficial impact on the amphibians, on the frogs in this particular area. And with that, it's attracted other species to come in as well. We've, uh, they found that grass snakes have started moving into the site only because of the increase um, in food availability there. And despite the name, grass snakes, um, they're also particularly fond of wetland habitats as well. So beaver habitats, perfect um, for grass snakes. Fish um, is a, a, um, another group that can benefit uh, from beavers, but fish is probably one of the, the groups that um, sort of does raise um, sort of the more controversy around beavers, sort of the, the pros um, and negatives um, of beaver reintroductions. Um, so, um, so it's one that's um, often debated uh, quite a bit. Lots of studies have been conducted in North America and across Europe um, in parts of North America. Um, they have been reintroducing uh, beavers to certain areas to help with um, fish, with salmon populations. And so, um, coming closer um, to home, um, the River Otter Beaver Trial, led by Devon Wildlife Trust, have been looking and monitoring uh, fish populations 
as part of, of the trial. Um, so beavers have only been around um, in parts of Britain for, for not that long. So we had the first beaver injection um, in Scotland in 2009, and since 2015, uh, the River Otter Beaver Trial has been running. Um, and so we've only had um, a few opportunities to study the impacts um, on, on fish populations. The Southampton University um, and West Country River Trust have been researching the impacts um, in Devon. So the River Otter was the most important river for, for salmon, and it's known locally for trout. It's also known for bullheads, uh, stone larch, eel, um, brook lamprey as well. Over the years, though, um, the habitat, the fish populations have been depleted in the River Otter because of the chronic uh, diffuse pollution, poor habitats. Um, and bar man made barriers to fish uh, migration as well. So, this is probably an opportunity to look um, at what's been happening at the River Otter. And Southampton University have been doing a lot of monitoring to establish a baseline, first of all, um, on the River Otter. Now, as part of the trial, the River Otter Beaver trial, um, a science and evidence forum um, was set up. Um, and so, this looked at the uh, relationship between um, beavers and fish. It is a highly complex relationship. There are many positives, but there are also negatives as well. So we do need to look at this uh, more closely and look, like, look at the localised changes, but also look at um, sort of sub-catchments and the overall catchments as well. What's been found, though, we need to look at fish populations on a whole and not necessarily just the individual fish. And because of the different species um, found on the river, um, from salmonids to bullheads, lampreys, eels, you need to look at the different habitats and sort of the, um, the conditions these different species like as well. And so, um, and also the impact of flow conditions on these different species. So it's not, it's not simple um, at all, there is lots of um, complex relationships detail in that. And so, um, the river otter, does have a variety of habitats, does have a diverse community um, of fish, and so, yeah, as I mentioned, these different habitats will benefit different fish species. Um, beavers have a potential to create some of these habitats, uh, different habitats um, in the river from creating a variety of habitats, changing flow regimes, um, and restoring habitats. Um, but beaver damming is likely to be the, sort of the main effect um, or have the greatest impact on, on different fish um, populations. Dams can be both negative and positive for fish. Um, beaver dams, um, the pools behind um, those dams can create refuges for fish, um, can uh, create different depths of water which different fish species um, take advantage of. Um, however, in some cases, they could uh, cause a barrier. Sort of in low flow events, it may uh, be trickier for fish to, to go over, over those dams and jump over those dams. However, um, on the River Otter, in some cases, they use this as an opportunity to monitor uh, those impacts on fish. Uh, so in some areas where possible, they left, where beaver dams were being created, they left some of these dams to develop and see what happened over time. And if dams are allowed to develop in certain areas, what you find is you get bypass channels forming around these dams, and even water flowing over these dams. So eventually, these will allow passage for migrating fish and will create new gravels um, for fish to utilise and use um, for spawning grounds. So here's a, another picture of a beaver dam. So as you can see, there are several outflows that are formed on this beaver dam. And so these outflows, fish can use these for migrating over. And so here we have a video from uh, the River Tail, um, which is part of the River Otter catchments. Uh, jumping over over the dams. This was recorded um, on on the River Otter. Go again. So on the River Tail, which part of the River Otter catchments. And so, so in some cases, fish are able to migrate over these these dams um, um, as well. Um, 
And so and the impacts of dams can vary over time. Some, some dams last longer than others, some are very mobile and temporary as well. And sometimes these dams will, will wash away. And this is what they found again on part of the River Rotter as well. Here we've got a picture um, of a dam on the left. Um, it was being created. Um, it's possible that this, um, in this case, so um, it was a, a temporary uh, barrier at the time, um, but it didn't last very long. It was washed out, and when it was washed out, they found there was um, nice, clean uh, gravel um, below it, so clean spawning uh, riffle, uh, crows behind it, and beautiful, clean gravel as well. Um, so lots of opportunities um, in these areas, so various uh, ranges of habitat benefiting uh, different species. The studies um, from the River Otter showed that, um, looked at beaver pools, um, so sampled areas where there were beaver pools and control uh, pools, and they generally found uh, that the beaver pools were, um, had, were better habitat for lampreys and bullheads, uh, and bullheads um, were found in river pool habitats below below the beaver dams because they required um, fast-flowing waters. They also, um, studies also found that the beaver pools had the highest biomass, fish biomass, and a larger trout were found in the beaver pools compared with uh, uh, the control streams. So this is just some of the results after, after the five-year trial. Further research is, is required on the impacts of fish in Britain. Um, as I said, beavers are only getting back for a short time in Britain. Um, and so, but it's... So our capacity to um, study the impacts on fish have been limited, but we now have opportunities to look at this, this further. For more information on the impacts of the fish, um, and also just the River Ross Beaver Trial in, in general, please do have a read of the Science and Evidence Report. It's worth reading. There's lots of information in there. There's links to various videos on YouTube as well. So other... Um, Wildlife that can benefit um, from, from beavers are mammals and other rodents as well, particularly benefit. So the waterfowl, or sometimes referred to as a mini beaver, um, so to speak, it's almost a, a mini version, so with the, the very orange teeth there. Um, waterfowls in some areas have been found to move into beaver habitats. You get a nice, um, soft um, banks being created where you have beaver canals and lots of vegetation which um, waterfowls can take advantage of. Here we have a water doll uh, taking advantage of some of the food that's been left out um, for, for beaver, the beavers, um, at the site in Wales, so a nice juicy apple there. And another video of a water doll um, in a beaver habitat, again taking some food that's been left out for the beavers. Um, other species of mammals, um, uh, other studies have looked at bats. So this is a study from, from Poland which looked at the three of the species and uh, nocturnal and compared um, habitats that have been uh, restored or created um, by beavers, um, so forests that have gaps in them created by, by beavers, and meadows that have been flooded um, through beaver activity, and then areas that didn't have any beaver um, um, activity, so meadows, meadows without flooding and forests without gaps in the canopy. And generally what they found, when you had beaver activity, there was a higher, higher um, number of uh, bat species across all the, the species looked at in this study. And generally this, what they found here is um, these were bats following the food source in the beaver areas, active areas, there was an increase in invertebrates, so the bats were following, so they were following the food resource. Bats will also take advantage of standing deadwood that's been created by beavers for roosting sites, sometimes being found in sort of snags on uh, beaver dams and, and beaver lodges as well, roosting in those. So bats generally do very well in beaver habitats. Other mammals um, uh, will explore beaver, beaver areas, uh, so you have a polecat exploring the beaver, beaver site. So having the increase of invertebrates that leads to increase in, in other small mammals, and uh, birds and amphibians can provide, can provide feeding opportunities for lots of other uh, creatures as well. And one of the species we get asked a lot about are otters. Um, so again, here we have an otter exploring uh, a beaver area and beaver habitats. And so 
Autism in Cambridge generally gets on um, very well. The only time where there is a bit of concern um, is during the breeding season uh, with beavers. When there are young uh, kids in the lodge, um, if the lodge is left unattended and an otter swims by and hears so those young in the lodge, they may try and take an opportunity to go inside and could potentially uh, predate on those uh, young beaver kits. However, that rarely happens because the beaver families are quite a close unit and will fend off um, any otters trying to get in the lodge. Similarly, if a beaver kit emerged from the lodge and was out on its own, a young kit, um, an otter might take an opportunity, but again, usually the rest of the family are around um, protecting um, those youngsters. Um, Otters themselves do very well uh, generally when beavers are around. They love foraging in beaver habitats, from beaver pools, in the beaver dams, taking advantage of all that food that's out there. Um, in Devon, the closed site, they found um, otters coming into to the beaver site and often see the feeding remains from otters as well. Otters will also utilise and live in abandoned beaver uh, for, uh, lodges as well, so even sort of resting opportunities for otters in beaver habitats. And generally, most of the time, as I said, otters and beavers get along quite nicely. And here we have a, sort of a documentary from, um, from the BBC with um, David Attenborough. And if I just go to the right point, just bear with me. Just an example of what other species no live um, within the beaver. Um, live within the beaver habitat. Our cameras catch a glimpse of what, at first sight, looks like a very small beaver. It's a muskrat. There are a pair of them in here. This is a new observation. Do the beavers actually know in the pitch blackness that there are strangers among them? We noticed that the muskrats regularly left the lodge to forage under the ice. And on several occasions, they returned a few minutes later with a load of fresh weeds. Perhaps the muskrats are paying rent by regularly providing fresh bedding for the lodge. Maybe that is why the beavers accept them and even allow them to share their food. Our infrared lights, however, are no longer welcome, it seems. So just a nice example there of other um, uh, mammals that benefit from beavers. That was taken in North America, so uh, muskrats are a North American species, so those are North American beavers. But it just gives you an example um, of different wildlife that can benefit. So it's well worth um, watching uh, the full length of that documentary. Um, it's a lovely piece um, written by David Attenborough. A, a nice video just to show um, uh, more henship taking advantage of a beaver and using it as a as a stepping stone. And this will take us to another beaver enclosed beaver site in in Wales. And so that's just an overview of some of the, the wildlife that can benefit um, from beavers. So it's just a snapshot. Loads of um, research has been done, uh, loads of information out there, as I mentioned, the River Otter um, Beaver Trial Report is, a, is a, a great one to read. Lots of information on the Wildlife Trust um, websites as well, and various beaver projects that we have with the Wildlife Trust. Um, as you may have heard, um, two weeks ago, uh, it was announced that the beavers on the River Otter were allowed to stay and can now naturally spread. Um, but now... Um, we still um, still need to sort of get a, a national beaver strategy together to look at um, other reintroduction projects and look at um, beavers across um, Britain as well and, and in England. Um, so for more information, please do visit uh, the Wildlife Trust website. And the Wildlife Trust are getting together campaigning for a national strategy 
two people put together um, so that we can look at areas where beavers can be reintroduced, but having a management system in place to ensure that we have the benefits of beavers but minimising um, or avoiding any, any negative impacts uh, where possible so we can all benefit um, from beavers. So please do look at uh, the Wild Naturalist website and support at campaign. And thank you very much for listening. Let's see if we've got any questions. We have a question. Okay. Which I'm going to read out to you. Okay. <laughs> so Karen Mitchell would like to know how large an area of beavers need. Um, so it's it all depends on the habitat that's available, really, um, and the food resources there. And so in a riparian system on a river system, uh, the, an average beaver territory is about three kilometres for a beaver family. However, if the habitat is really good, then that's, that territory can be as small as 4.5 kilometres, or it can be as long, um, but if the habitat is more fragmented, then sometimes those territories can be as long um, as 7 kilometres. Okay, thank you. I've got a question. Yep. How long will it be before we see beavers back in Shropshire? <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> So at the moment, um, Shropshire Wildlife Trust um, are looking at um, having beavers back in Shropshire, looking at um, some enclosed sites um, within, within Shropshire, but beavers could really help uh, with restoring natural processes from looking at helping to reduce downstream flooding and also helping to improve wetland habitats as well. So we're just putting plans together for that and we hope it won't be too long before beavers are back. But we'll keep you posted, so do keep a look out on Shropshire Wildlife Trust websites um, and on their social media page, pages as well. I, another question from over here. Yep. What about washing beavers? Is there somewhere I can go where that I stand a good chance of seeing beavers? Yep, so there's a few places. Um, well, um, those videos that I showed you today, a lot of them were from an enclosed beaver site um, in Wales. Um, that does have a hide on the site, so it is possible to go and visit those beavers. So the best way to do that, we have been arranging visits um, over the summer months uh, to watch beavers. Unfortunately, we haven't done this year because of COVID, but we hope that next year um, we'll be able to restart those visits again. So it's from, usually from late spring um, throughout the summer to early autumn that we have those beaver visits. So if you'd like to, to visit, please do drop me an email and I can arrange that um, with the landowner of that site so we can book some beaver visits in. It's so also worth looking at um, the Wildlife Trust website as well and looking at what local beaver um, projects are happening with your local uh, wildlife trust because some of them you'll be able to potentially visit as well. Um, and so, yeah, if you look at your a wildlife, local wildlife trust website and uh, see if they've got any, if they're looking at or have a beaver um, project in the area, and there'll be more information about whether you're able to visit or not. Usually, um, they will be um, pre. Um, you have to pre book, but yeah, you're like wildlife, just we have to, to inform you on that. I think that's it for questions tonight, so okay. we can probably wrap it up there. So, we do have a guest. Bye. He doesn't have names. If you have any names, suggestions, please do email us. <laughs> Not Justin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening and tuning in.